everybody welcome back to the latest uh, webinar in the independent gyms webinar series we are now at webinar number 18 so since january i think it was the fourth we did the first one around then so we've, uh, we've sort of done with these 18 now in total we've got a few more booked in for heading into april as well and part of may so um thank you for joining us um today's webinar is hosted by partners and in particular lead dancing um partners and are a lead partner with the independent gyms platform and uh, they're also one of the leading independent uh, leading insurance companies within the uk um particularly around the leisure sector and fitness sector as well i think a lot of you guys will already be using partners and or if you're not you've probably heard of them and hopefully we'll be looking at them for your quotes on renewal coming up soon so um today's webinar is all about uh, employee well-being um looking particularly at uh, supporting the well-being and engagement in and out of work and some useful tools um and sort of strategies you can adopt to um look after the responsibility of employees so on that note i'm going to hand over to lee we will do the q a at the end as usual if you've got any questions fire them through the chatter feature um and on that note over to you lee good afternoon everyone um my name is lee dauncy as robert alluded to um quick intro of myself i i'm an employee benefits specialist i've been working now in the industry for about 20 years um and i've worked a lot on well-being and uh, engagement initiatives for clients, large and small, all across the globe. Um, today, what I'd like to do is take a, a few minutes, really, sort of talking about why, um, particularly now more so than ever, employee well-being engagement is should be at the top of the agenda from a, a company looking at um, their employee um, structure moving forward. So I've put together a few slides. I wanted to start with just a brief introduction of who partners and are for those of you who aren't using us um, it, it's we're effectively a business that was established as a challenger brand around 12 months ago and we're we're very much devoted to really sort of um, driving change within an industry which we believe has gone a bit stagnant and a bit stale and and maybe lost focus um, big conglomerates driving a lot of industry practices. We're very much getting back to our roots um, or back to the advisory roots um, and driving that added value to our clients. But we're looking at being an insurance advisor and a risk consultant and advisor to our clients as opposed to a, a product placement insurance broker. So Partners Hand really have developed a strategy around people risk. Um, and we, we effectively have defined people risk as essentially, you know, your people are at the heart of your business and it's about understanding the, the risk potentially that can, you can be exposed to from the people that you, that you employ, whether it's from a key, key person scenario, whether it's from a um, well-being, engagement and benefit scenario and understanding that actually having more better engaged employees and a healthier set of employees will actually mitigate some of the risks you ex you're exposed to. As a risk consultant, it's very hard to think about any line of insurance business that poten potentially isn't impacted by your people. And when you look at the claims that potentially you may have, employer liabilities claims, damage claims, a lot of that is driven by the people that you, um, you employ as a business. So there's a few key stats here that I wanted to, to introduce to you around why potentially man understanding the exposure that your people present to you um, is of, should be of such a, a strong um, relevance to you as an organization. So these are a few stats that we put together, and there are literally hundreds of stats that we, we, could, we could give you around why managing that employee risk perspective is so important to you as a business in terms of your pro productivity and profitability. But if we take this, 64% of employees have reported a significant increase in anxiety and depression as a result of the pandemic. Um, I, I would suggest perhaps that within your own industry where you, there have been perhaps even um, some more poignant stresses placed across your, placed upon your employees, that this figure may even be higher. 
um, and that I'd be interested in getting your views on that at the end of the at the end of the presentation. Um, Sixty percent or greater um, the, the, is the increase in which you see disenga disengaged employees make errors. So we're talking around, and this may be in terms of health and safety, following a health and safety perspective, um, we you will see increases in human errors. Could be, you know, it, it, rule of thumb, if you were driving a, if you were in in a, dry, a running a fleet policy, a disengaged employee is more likely to have an accident potentially. Nineteen percent. Um, sorry, excuse me, just a second. 19% is the number of employees that reported to take a day off due to stress, but have cited other reasons. And then lastly, and I think this is uh, probably the most striking of, of figures, is that in 2017, the estimated cost to employers was between 33 and 42 billion pounds in terms of employees' poor health. So, you can see from these statistics why one managing um, the health and well-being of your employees is so important because of the, the potential impact on productivity, the potential impact on the errors that your employees may be making. Um, and lastly, just in terms of the financial cost to, um, to the industry in terms of people taking, and this is just, that's just poor mental health. This isn't, physical days off. This is just got, this is just the cost to businesses of employees suffering from poor mental health condition, uh, poor mental health. So what do we do it? What do we do about it from an organization perspective? And what are we encouraging in organizations to do? We very much look through the lens of three uh, uh, employee um, benefits and well-being through the lens of three core areas. The first of which is engagement. And what we mean by that is how engaged are your employees with you as an organization? How emotionally invested are they in the success of your business? And the more engagement and the more invested people are in the success of your business, your business the more productive they will be and the more potentially profitable that will be for you as an organization. Well-being, from a well-being perspective, and I'm, I'm conscious I'm talking to a lot of people who will be acutely aware, certainly from the physical well-being aspect of how important it is, but we categorize well-being in three areas. One is physical, um, the second is mental, and the lastly would be financial well-being. And they're all interlinked, let's be quite frank, um, but it's understanding that we've, we select those three areas and it's not when we're talking about physical, mental and financial well-being, it's not, it's not or it's a short-sighted view or a false economy to just look at that from a lens of what people are getting in access to work in, in the workplace. It needs to be a holistic view. You know, your, the lifestyles, and the home stresses of the employees that you um, are fortunate enough to employ will have an impact on how productive and how their and their performance when they're in the workplace. And the last thing is benefits. And um, I think this is the traditional view of benefits would be would be you know pension, healthcare. But I think now in this in this new age, as it were, you know, it's much more important to to understand and look at the benefits that you're providing. It could be coffee morning. It could be biscuits in the in the reception room, it, uh, in the staff room. Essentially, anything you do to enhance the working life of your of the individuals that you employ we would classify as a benefit and it's good to, it's as, as a benefit and it's good to understand what you're doing in terms of that benefit provision. So I wanted to share with you a little bit then of um, 
a, a little bit of a skeleton, I guess, around uh, the, C, the six key steps that businesses should be looking to do. So there was a, a, a report that was commissioned by the government back in 2017, um, the Stevenson Pharma report, which specifically concentrates on mental health. And I'm, I'm going to be talking about mental health today because primarily I think in the current climate, obviously it's a hot topic um, and particularly poignant for uh, a, given the stresses that the increased stresses that everyone is under at the moment. So these are the six steps, if you like, that the, as a result of that report, the government recommended that organizations, any in organizations in employing uh, with employees should be looking to adopt. So the first is of evaluate risk and create a plan. So what we mean by this is produce, implement, and communicate a mental health at work plan that promotes good mental health for all of your employees, that outlines for those who may need it, where they can get support from. So leading into providing those tools of support. So develop those mental health tools. And this is, again, government advice that will enable you to it will enable you to support your employees, but create those pathways and, you know, for want of a better word, advertise the fact that that support is available for your employees. Understand what it looks like and then promote it. Three is mental health intervals. So encourage open conversations around mental health. I think that's probably something that as, um, as a society, now is becoming less of an issue. The stigma around mental health is diminishing, but it's extremely important to understand um, that to some, to some people, it's still a difficult subject to talk about. And that by encouraging open, open discussion amongst, with your employees, whether you're in management with your employees or between employees alike, um, will help promote better mental health of the individuals that you're managing. Provide good working conditions. I think that speaks for itself, um, but it will help people. You know, if life is stressful, if you anything you can do from an employ, employer perspective to reduce the stress that one faces in work will only help you in terms of optimizing your people's performance. Five is regular health and well-being conversations we've talked about, and six is routine monitoring. So. What are you doing by way of an organization to monitor the health of your, the mental health of your employees and understand the stress and the triggers and what precaution, what um, pathways do you have in place to help your employees that are struggling? And I think this is, you know, we, we touched on the 64% the of people who are suffering from anxiety at the moment at the beginning of the presentation, um, you know, no one really, no, you cannot understand the individual, uh, the stresses that an individual is going un, uh, under. But I think it's fair to say that anyone who has not had, had more thought or consciousness around their mental health in, in the last year or so um, is probably not telling, the, is probably not giving you an honest, um, an, an honest view of how, they, how they've been dealing with the, the stresses of this scenario um, and it's not to say that you know I think the key from your from an employer's perspective is to understand that when we return to work yes there will be a certain alleviation of of perhaps anxiety that people have been suffering but with the return to work could be a whole host of new anxieties and effective stresses which can be managed by you or you can support your employees in dealing with. So what can you do as an organization by way of effectively managing this? There are a few things that um, we're suggesting that all organizations do in, in any industry, but particular, uh, um, but in your sector, um, these messages will resonate too, is review what you are currently doing. So if you, some organizations may be acutely aware, some of you 
as employers may be acutely aware of what you're already doing by way of supporting your employees' well-being and engagement. But review that, look at it again, understand it. And if you feel you can do more, then look at how you can produce that, uh, deliver more support to your employees. If you've not thought about it at all, please put it on the agenda. Understand that people risk is real and that the impact of the performance of your people can be impacted by, um, by just making a few minor changes. Formalize a strategy moving forward. Maximize the impact of the provisions currently in place. So this is something that we find a lot of, a lot of our clients may already have a lot of tools within their arsenal, if you like. They may, or, or through the products they're buying, if they've got a group life policy or they've got um, some insurance protection in place for their employees, you may find a lot of support is, is already there from a mental health perspective, from a well-being perspective. But what tends to happen is that certainly from a, a, an insurance broker perspective, the concentration is just on the mitigating the risk and managing the risk. And the added benefits that many providers offered are not being utilized effectively. So you may find that within the current provisions that you already have in place, there is already significant support by way of mental health or well-being. So we would suggest that you look at that and make sure you're maximizing your return on investment from that perspective. If you're already paying for it, make sure you're maximizing it. And then simple things can make a huge difference. This isn't, we're, we're not, it doesn't have to cost the earth to make, to put in some really significant um, strategies around mental health and encouraging engagement and well being. With, um, and it, so it doesn't, for example, again, typically what you would expect to see companies buying is private medical insurance or pensions, which are traditionally very expensive benefits. It doesn't, it, you don't need to look in those parameters. There are plenty of products available. There are plen plenty of things that you can do as an organization that will promote better well being and better engagement um, without, you know, some of them are actually nil impact from a cost perspective, and some are very minimal from a cost perspective. An EAP can cost as little as six or seven pounds per life and effectively will provide counseling services for your employees, face-to-face -face counseling. Um, there are cash plans available. There are lots of wellness initiatives and calendars that are available. And what we would suggest, what you can do as an organization is build that into your employee value proposition so that you are promoting well, mental health, well-being, promoting well-being, promoting better engagement, and seeing that return in terms of productivity and optimum performance of your employees. So that was a, a very quick overview, if you like. Does anyone have any questions for me? Hey, thanks very much for that. Um, I think sort of this sort of subject is always quite interesting, isn't it? I think a lot of people have glossed over it in the past and not really paid attention to it until it's until it's needed. Um, and I think the last 12 months of what we've all been going through has, um, has sort of brought it right to the forefront. So um, it's always interesting to, to, to hear and to see these sorts of webinars. So thank you for that. Um, a few from me, the, the first one that stood out was the cost of, was it 33 to 42 billion pounds? Yeah, yeah. The, for the industry, which is huge. I mean, how would that break down? How would you how would you pin that down to an individual site? What sort of costs would have, would have well, that, I mean, if you if you take that's the that's to so it's that's not specifically to your industry, Robert, yeah. but it's the broader the broader um, industry. But if you think of um, there are some there are some there are many many statistics. Um, but if you think about there, one that perhaps I didn't feature was that um, essentially 30, I think it's 33% of organizations that are disengaged are 33% are less inclined. Sorry, I'm, let me get this right. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm quoting statistics off the top of my head and I, I don't want, I mean, effectively the impact to employers is significant. If you look at 
um, that figure of 42 billion and consider in today's society that probably we're talking about a, a, you know a, a, a mental health scenario a situation like this those figures are going to be huge to organizations i think it's 21 percent more productive when you are help when you have healthy engaged employees is the statistic i was looking to quote yeah and i, I think that's just true isn't it i think if, you, if your employees are happy healthy and engaged they, they're going to be more productive and they're going to get more out of it which is which is great how would you i would um how would we best measure the mental health or, or best track and the mental health of employees is there a, any any sort of strategies around that so there are plenty there are plenty of things that you can do there are cognitive um questionnaires that you can have completed but i think what the what the stevens and farmer report was sort of really highlighting is that it's taking away that stigma of it within work around mental health so mm -hmm. talking about it openly um, and recognizing perhaps when someone is noticeably either productivity has dropped or something's changed that you you can't put your finger on and then openly having that conversation with the individual but also providing the support mechanism so things like employee assistance programs are a fantastic way of providing expert mental health support to your employees without potentially costing the earth. So an employee assistance program is essentially a 24 hour telephone line where people can get all kinds of advice, whether it's financial management, whether it's um, mental health or even physical well-being in certain instances. And when there's pathways clearly defined within that that supports face-to-face -face counseling, et cetera, as well. Do you find that those sorts of schemes, if they're more confidential, are going to have more cut through? Because I think there's maybe there's still this, even though we talk openly about mental health awareness and so on, I think there's still a stigma that you don't want to approach your, your boss if you're having a tough time with it because it might be seen as detrimental. So would a confidential sort of assistance like that cut through better? Yeah, and it, it and and these lines are entirely confidential. To confidential, um, so the EAPs are confidential. You as an you as an employer will not be privy. And as you say, that that certainly gives perhaps that in, gives employees sort of more peace of mind, if you like, to engage mm -hmm. with these services. But what we have found is there's still an element of promotion. The employer needs to promote these services. You find that when when you have engaged employees and you know, an employer that's taken the time to explain the benefit that's being put in place for them and take again, take away that stigma where you see much higher utilization rates. So we see, you know, when you talk to EAP providers, they will tell you that a standalone EAP, which is one which they would have been would have been promoted to employees, will see utilization as high as maybe 10 percent. Whereas ones that are embedded and integrated with no real um, promotion, if you like, or um, discussion around, you will see much lower utilization in line of one, maybe one to two percent. Yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? And if it's front and center in there, it's in front, of, it's in your mind all the time that there's support there, you're more likely to engage with it, I think, which is true. Um, we talked about the benefits, so the three, three approaches, engagement, well-being and benefits. What are sort of three quick and easy benefits you could introduce to help with the well-being? What would you be your your favourite three to introduce for a for a gym facility? Would you say? Put you on the spot here. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, and in, do you know what? one would be a social benefit. So yeah. whether it's having coffee meetings or um, you know that and and that's something that costs nothing, right? Building that sense of team spirit within within the organization doesn't necessarily have to cost anything at all um but that would be certainly building out that whether it or you know as i said as i alluded to it doesn't have to cost the earth you know putting fruit and biscuits in your in your staff room is a benefit to employees and it's one which you know in terms of perceived um perceived value to a, to an employee i think it, it's a very easy win from a more robust scenario you might be looking at as we alluded to an eap or a cash plan 
um, where there is a cost involved to you as an employer. But again, you you're high, you would what we would do is partner as an organization, we would then partner with you to make sure you're maximizing the impact of that delivery, making sure employees understand it, making sure they know how to utilize it and making sure that it is being used as a platform to pr promote better engagement and better well-being. Um, so those are the main two, and I guess the, the last one would be around the financial well-being side of things. There's, there's some, again, relatively low cost things that you can do as an organization. We, there are plenty of benefits platforms out there, when I say ben or discount platforms out there, where you can provide access to your employees to a suite of discounts, et cetera, um, which will generate savings for them um, as, a, as, an in, uh, as an individual. And again, that perceived value can be quite high and, it, and it, the, that type of benefit. I guess what, in summary, what I'm trying to say is any, any benefit you look to implement, look, at, look through the lens of how you can use that to promote better well-being and better engagement. Because it's through improved well-being and improved engagement that you, drive, you are driving, you will be able to drive optimum performance or improve performance. Um, I don't think there's, you know, you know, optimum performance probably doesn't exist, let's be honest. It's a, you know, but improved performance is where we've been looking to get to. And you can you can use your benefits effectively to drive those two areas and drive that improved performance outcome. Yeah, right. Well, last um, real question for me, really. How would the strategies have changed or how can you see them change with the, the increase in like, the work from home scenario? I mean, it's not necessarily applicable to gyms, but we've all been on lockdown for 12 months or, you know, the, more and more people are, are not going to the usual workplace. Um, well, it's, it's interesting because we've already seen some statistics that are coming out and I, I won't try and quote them again off the top of my head because <laughs> that uh, unpicked me a little bit last time. But this, the, the number of individuals now that are much more focused on an employer that drives that well-being and that sense of engagement over just the sort of traditional benefits that were the you many many um, companies would be looked to implement is 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 significant. So we're seeing definitely a switch in the trend and the focus from a benefits perspective. We're seeing um, we're seeing a trend in terms of yeah, I guess from a gym perspective, you guys are working from home is going to be less of an issue yeah. for um, for the independent um, from an independent gym management perspective. Um, but we are seeing that. A lot of, I guess, from a positive to your industry impact, a lot of companies are getting are thinking about how they can promote that health, well-being, and activity of employees that are more based at home. So, a lot of more companies are looking at how they sort of partner with gyms, drive um, activities, and build their well-being around external activities to drive well-being and engagement. So potentially, I think that could be a positive for your industry because more and more companies are acutely aware of what their obligations to drive better um, well-being, and they're they're looking at ways in which they can support their their employees' health, not only you know not only physical but from a mental health perspective. Activity is extremely extremely. Um, strong driver in in, in uh, mental health as well so they're looking at how they can support and partner with the right um with the right um with the right industries to drive that better well-being and focus so i know that one just just yesterday i was talking to a client that essentially has this work work from home scenario they've got um, they're moving to a three day a week, so three days in the office, two from home, and they're reviewing their entire well-being strategy, and they're looking at running online courses uh, or online classes specifically for their employees for when they're working at home on evenings and so. And they're they're looking at how they source that. Um, so in terms of the independent gym um, 
organization, I'm guessing there will be lots of more inquiries to you guys around, can you do some online classes for us, for our company, um, and, and um, promote that well-being and engagement that we're looking for. Yeah, definitely. And that's a really useful subject. Because I think historically, a gym membership paid for by a company was one of the benefits that, or, that could easily be thrown in for the right price. I think. And the way the industry is moving and then home workers and like you say, three days in the office, two days at home, those two days where you still want to do your exercise, but you're, you're not in central London, you, you, you work from home. Delivering the online classes, if that continues, then that's a, not an, ob an obvious benefit for those people that are working from home. So I think you're, you're definitely right there. Yeah, and, and I think there's there's much more, people are paying less lip services to this now. So it was really easy to tick the well-being box, let's say, historically by saying, okay, well, we're going to offer a gym membership. But they're not really promoting individuals using the using that gym membership, just sort of sort of doing it and then forgetting about it. What we're seeing now is many more companies are really, really sort of proactively engaged in trying to drive those better well-being outcomes. So it's not just a tick box exercise anymore. You know, it, talking again about EAPs, employee assistance programs, so many more companies now are looking at how they maximize the impact of providing the benefit. And for many years in our industry, to be frank, it was just being positioned as a tick box exercise. You can, you can spare yourself from litigation from a stressed employee if you have an EAP in place. Now it's a much more about, this is a genuine benefit with a lot of value to your employees um, at a relatively low cost. Ma to maximize the impact, you need to be able to promote that and make sure employees understand truly how, how um, valuable it is. Um, and I think more employees are, again, removing that stigma more employees now are, are, are more comfortable discussing utilization of an EAP. I still don't, I still think we've got some time, to, some, a long way to go, let's say, but yeah. certainly now that, that stigma is, is, is dropping. And so we're seeing, we are seeing more increase in utilization anyway, um, compounded them through promotion of, of, from the companies that have been putting them in place. We are, you know, we are, they are being utilized as real support mechanisms as opposed to just those tick box exercises that I think lots of companies have been paying lip service, let's say, historically. And so it's taken a national or an international crisis, but certainly a lot of organizations are taking it a lot more seriously now. And that's probably a good note to, to summarize, really, in that case. So I think for me, it's all about, like you say, it's not just paying lip service, it's actually implementing the support for employees um so how if some of the guys wanted to reach out to you in terms of the eaps and the other sort of services and you offer um do you want to run through your contact details and uh, we can get some some of the guys on sure. well, my contact details are on the screen now um and you can feel please feel free to reach out to me um and one of the things that has occurred to me is whether or not there's an opportunity to sort of set up almost a, a sort of clients of scheme for, in, independent, for the independent gym members. Um, so that's something that we'll be exploring, I think, um, down the line. I, I guess the question is, if these types of services resonate firstly with, with the, your members, then we would look at how we could perhaps make them more easily implementable for, for them. Fantastic. That sounds like a good idea to me. So on that note, Lee, I'm going to thank you for your time. I really appreciate you hosting today. It's been an interesting listen. We'll obviously get this uh, posted up in the group later for anybody who's not been able to, to tune in. We'll have it on the YouTube channel as well. So if you do want to reach out to, the, to Lee at Partners and um, we'll pop his details on the, uh, on the post in the group as well. And on that note, Lee, thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye.